Ladies and gentlemen, my beloved brethren and sistren, welcome back to the Tawahado Bible Study Podcast. My apologies for the lengthy two-month hiatus. One of my favorite mangas slash anime is called Hunter x Hunter, and it is a notorious series that its own fanatics refer to as hiatus x hiatus affectionately. And I feel the sting because I haven't done my duty. I will try not to lengthily defend myself, but sinner that I am, I will defend myself. I've had a few life changes. The last time I had a gap between podcasts, it was huge, and it had to do with some other catastrophic digital events in addition to life events. But I got married, holy matrimony happened, and I also moved with my beloved to a location that we would both be co-living in. So a lot has gone on. Uh, I've also been kind of doing a career change amidst all this madness as well. So please forgive me and keep me in your prayers. Now, the Bible as a Literature, which is the flagship of the Ephesus School Network, and indeed, I think it speaks on behalf of the whole Ephesus School Network in firmly be believing and being situated in the Antiochian or the Antiochian school of biblical exegesis or interpretation. And what's fascinating is that this is not something I grew up knowing about, but there was this these distinct schools of biblical exegesis or interpretation, the Alexandrian school, which represented more of the sort of Greco-Hellenistic thought, and the philosophies that come associated with that and the Antiochian approach, which I, I believe was predominantly, you know, Syriac influenced and thus Semitic. But one of its most famous proponents, of course, his writings come to us in Greek. That's John Chrysostom, the man with uh, gold for a mouth. So the Antiochian approach is very different than the Alexandrian approach. And there's a great article that you could sift through the Ephesus School Network's main page, and you will be able to see the finer details of what it is. Or if you do some of your own searching on your search engine of choice, you can also do that. But the big thing for me is that without me knowing it growing up, the Tirigwame Bit, which is the Aksumite school of biblical exegesis, has had Western scholars independently come to a consensus that it is itself situated also in the Antiochian school of biblical exegesis. You can call it historical accident, or you can call it the grace of God. And what makes it weirder is that there's this mix of Alexandria and Antioch within the Aksumite tradition because our hierarchs or our bishops came from Egypt, from Alexandria, for the longest time. So hierarchically, perhaps even liturgically, I, I know at least the, the main part of the liturgy, beginning of the liturgy is straight up the Alexandrian rite, R-I-T-E. So liturgically, hierarchically, we're Alexandrian, but our form of biblical exegesis, biblical interpretation, is in the prestigious interpretation tradition of John Chrysostom, of Ephraim the Syrian, who of course wrote in Syriac, and Isaac the Syrian, who also wrote in Syriac, and Jacob of Saruk, who also wrote in Syriac. Of course, we have our own scholars, Dusiarid, more hymnographer, but uh, you can see the Antiochian school of biblical exegesis even in his hymnography. And huge people, Memher Esros, um, I mean, huge people across the centuries, Memher Kifla Georgis, uh, Abba Bahari, so many uh, various people, Abba Georgis of Gasicha in the is right or Aksumite tradition. And all of them had this approach where their number one goal is the preservation of the text. And they do this both orally and through writing with a sort of minimalist contextual interpretation. And so in easing back out of my hiatus and in giving do respect and homage to the Antiochian school of biblical exegesis and its 
living memory within the Ephesus School Network, but also back home in Ethiopia in the Aksumite School of Biblical Exegesis, also known as Tereguamebet, or Interpretation House. Uh, today, I will be just saying a few points on the front end, and then I'm going to read Romans chapter 5 in its entirety to you. So the first point is that, again, we're continuing this theme of justification or the declaration of righteousness. It's rare for what we hear in the Gospel of John chapter 15 is called no greater love, laying down your life for another. It's rare for that to happen for a righteous person. So it's almost unfathomable to do it for a non-righteous person or a sinner, and yet that's what the Lord Jesus does for us. The second point I want to mention is that you see this movement, this path from tribulations to hope. If you ever hear a gospel that is without tribulations, may they be anathema. May they be accursed. Because there is no other gospel. There is no other way to hope than through tribulations. And this is actually a huge motif of the writings of Isaac the Syrian. Uh, he has some misguided views on the salvation of all, but he is relentless in his approach of sharing his sage advice for people to check themselves, to examine every spirit, and to particularly examine a spirit if it seems to be a spirit lacking in tribulations. The Christian life should not be alga ba alga, mattress upon mattress or cloth upon cloth. Everything shouldn't be easy peasy cover girl. So keep that in mind as you keep your hope fixated on not your own declaration, a self-declaration of righteousness, but the declaration of righteousness that comes from God because of the reconciliation that happens to us through his beloved son, his one-of-a-kind son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The final point I'll make before I read is to remember your context. Your context is that of democracy. Your context is that of committees. And so sometimes a word like reign, R-E-I-G-N, which has to do with what a king does. That's why in Spanish, reina is queen and rey is king. There's a Latin root there. So the reign or the kingship, the rule by king, the absolutist monarchy, or the Caesarism, the Augustanism, a military dictatorship for those who want to put it pejoratively, is being compared between sin's reign and grace's reign. So it's not a bunch of different ideas coming together to form one idea. It's one force, one entity reigning over you, which is sin, and it has become overcome. It has succumbed to the will of grace, which is now in charge. So say goodbye to sin. And in fact, this is in our Udasi Mariam or Praise of Mary. It's also at the end here of Romans chapter 5, and you'll hear it. But where there is an abundance of grace, or whether there's a, there where there are many sins or a multitude of sins, there too is an abundance of grace. It's phrased different ways. Uh, today I'm reading from the KJV. In the KJV versus the LEB versus uh, different Amharic translations, translations of the prayer books, you'll see this phrased in numerous ways. But if you get the main teaching, you will be able to recognize it in all the different places that it shows up. I said I would be brief. Of course, I talk for a vocation, and so that will be very difficult for me to be brief. Now I'll get to the text itself, Romans chapter 5, from the King James Version. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith 
into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered, that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord.